Hello, and welcome to Cognitum, a show dedicated to exploring the present and future of science and technology. I'm your host, Iosef Gerstein. Our guest today is Dr. Thomas Seyfried, professor at Boston College and author of the groundbreaking book, Cancer as a Metabolic Disease. Professor Seyfried, welcome. Oh, thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here. So the application of your theory, what does it entail? Well, once you realize that the, the, the problem that we're dealing with cancer is a mitochondrial metabolic disease, the strategies now for uh, management become very different than what is currently being done. So we realized that in order for these tumor cells to grow, as I mentioned in our papers, they need fermentable fuels. Without fermentation, uh, they can't grow. The fermentable fuels provide energy, ATP. Without energy, nothing can grow, regardless of the genetic constitution of the cell. So cells need energy. The energy comes from either respiration, which is how we get most of our energy in our normal cells, we breathe, or they ferment like cancer cells. The issue, of course, is that fermentation energy is a very inefficient source. So in order to make up the difference between respiratory energy, which is extremely efficient, and fermentation energy, which is very inefficient, the, the, the supply of fermentable fuels much be far greater to run fermentation energy than respiratory energy. Knowing that, killing tumor cells then becomes um, uh, more approachable by pulling out or restricting the availability of fermentable fuels, which is glucose and glutamine. Those are the two prime fuels that drive cancer because they're the fuels that drive the fermentation machinery. So without glucose and glutamine, no tumor cells can survive. There's simply not enough energy in the microenvironment, other fuels that can replace these two very abundant fuels. So the strategies then become, how do we restrict the availability of fermentable fuels, glucose and glutamine, to tumor cells? And that's the strategy for management. So you eat these fermentable fuels, or are they endogenously produced? Glucose is predominantly taken in from the diet. Almost all foods, in one way or another, are broken down to, glutamine, or to glucose. We can take foods that are full of glucose, or we can make glucose from amino acids. We can make glucose internally. The issue, of course, is that to make glucose from amino acids, you have to invest energy. So energy invested, energy produced. Whereas glucose, the molecule itself, is pure energy. And most of the foods that we eat contain uh, glucose in one form or another. Glutamine cannot be managed by any dietary therapy or approach that we know of, mainly because glutamine can be made from glucose. So if I shut down glucose, I can restrict the availability, I can at least restrict a little bit of glutamine. But glutamine is in our muscles, it's in our bloodstream, it's the most abundant amino acid. Therefore, drugs must be used to restrict the availability of glutamine. So it's a combination of dietary restriction of glucose or personal discipline and drugs that work to restrict glutamine. And this is the, the cutting edge right now. The cutting edge is how we develop therapies that will restrict fermentable fuels. Metabolic therapy is basically a but, yeah. dietary intervention. Uh, only part, because you need the drug. We, you, diet alone cannot target glutamine. And as long as glutamine is still available, you run the risk of keeping tumors, some tumor cells alive that depend heavily on glutamine. And as I've mentioned, metastatic cells most cells of our immune system use glutamine as a major uh, fuel and, and metabolite. So we, we, must, we must target that with certain kinds of drugs once we restrict the availability of glucose. It has to be done simultaneously. Otherwise, you, allow, you, you risk having cancer cells survive. If you target only glutamine and not glucose, you target glucose and not glutamine, you run the risk of saving some of these tumor cells. Metabolic therapy consists of what elements and how are they implemented? So metabolic therapy, we published a big paper on this. It was called the Press Pulse 
uh, strategy to annihilate tumor cells or um, manage the disease. These concepts came from the field of paleobiology. Uh, appears during epochs in the history of the Earth, there were massive extinctions of organisms on the planet. Those massive extinctions occurred only when two unlikely events happened simultaneously. A chronic stress on a population followed by a, by a, by a catastrophic event, like a meteor strike or a volcanic series of eruptions together with a climatic stress together uh, what led to mass extermination of organisms. So we took that same concept from paleobiology and apply it to the cancer problem. So we feel that if we can create a chronic stress on one available fuel, <coughs> such as glucose, through a dietary or therapeutic ketosis, and then at the same time, a specific targeting drug to hit glutamine at a specific time, we feel that we can create the same phenomenon, which is mass extinction of tumor cells, but we try to do it gradually so as not to overwhelm the body by a massive amount of death from tumor cells, which can lead to tumor lysis syndrome and a kind of an anaphylactic uh, cytokine release problem, which could end up uh, causing death. And this is what happens with some of the immunotherapies. Some of these are so, are so powerful that patients die secondarily from massive tumor cytokine release, tumor lysis syndrome. Tumor cytokine release, the mass death of of cells yes. that overwhelms the ability of the body to clean itself. Yes, and you can die very, very quickly from organ failures, uh, very rapid organ failures, can, this can happen. And this is one of, the, one of the drawbacks of the immunotherapies. They can sometimes kill you by, by doing these kinds of things, causing too much lysis at first, or they can turn on your own organs and put you at risk for inadvertent effects on, on, on systems. And, and metabolic therapy avoids that. The, the purpose of metabolic therapy is to selectively target the tumor cells without uh, harming any of the normal cells in the body. This is, so we, we marginalize the, the, the metabolic problem of the tumor cell, and then we transition the body over to ketones, which protects them, an alternative fuel, while we specifically target the, the glutamine and glucose. Tumor cells can't use ketone bodies because you need a good respiration. So therefore, the normal cells are transitioned over first, and then once they're transitioned over, we can hammer the glucose and glutamine with specific drugs, but not harming the rest of the body because they're burning an alternative fuel. Elegant, beautiful. So you start with a ketogenic diet. Well, we start with therapeutic ketosis. Whether a ketogenic diet delivers that or not, that's one possibility. The state is therapeutic ketosis. And there are many different ways you can do that. There's ketone supplementation together with food restriction. There are some types of ketogenic diets that can put you into therapeutic ketosis. So we look at individuals based on their age, their health status, and determine what might be the best course to bring that individual into a state of therapeutic ketosis. So there's where we have some flexibility. But we have a monitor to know whether or not the individual is in fact in therapeutic ketosis. That's step number one. First step is measure all the blood work before you do anything. So you know what the status of that individual is before you begin any kind of a treatment. So we know where we are. Each individual is their own control. So they work on what they have. Many of these individuals are, have uh, significant abnormalities in blood work. Their, their cholesterol, HDL, LDL, C-reactive protein, triglycerides, often these are very imbalanced in these individuals. So you have to know where you start. And as you begin the treatment, the metabolic therapy, we often see a, 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 a return to normalcy of many of these metabolites, while at the same time you're degrading slowly the tumor. So it's, it becomes a, health, a total health program. You're taking an individual that has cancer and often many other maladies, not always, but you're bringing that individual to a new state of health while you're, while you're degrading the tumor slowly. Primarily by suppressing glucose intake. And glutamine. So you suppress, and as I said in the press pulse, uh, strategy which was published by myself and Dom D'Agostino, an expert in hyperbaric oxygen and, and human physiology, uh, Dr. George Yu, an oncologist from Washington, uh, um, George Washington University, and Dr. Uh, Joe Maroon, team surgeon and uh, for the Pittsburgh football Steelers and also uh, neurosurgeon. So we put this strategy together as a group of basic scientists and physicians to see how we could move patients from a state of unhealth to a state of health based on a gradual targeting of the tumor cells and 
uh, monitoring um, blood markers to know the overall health status of the individual. We also know that stress management is an extremely important component of the metabolic approach. When people have cancer, they often have anxiety uh, as the result of some impending doom or what, what they have been led to believe. So we use various kinds of forms of stress management which lowers blood sugar. So stress elevates sugar, stress management lowers sugar. So at the same time, we're managing, putting patients into therapeutic ketosis, we're also managing their stress. And then once they reach a certain state of therapeutic ketosis, we then administer drugs together with hyperbaric oxygen as a way to kill tumor cells because hyperbaric oxygen creates oxidative stress and tumor cells are vulnerable to oxidative stress, especially when you remove their fermentable fuels. As long as tumor cells have a large amount of glucose and glutamine, they actually protect themselves against oxidative stress. So this is, this is why chemo, many chemo, many cancer patients are resistant to chemo and resistant to radiation because their tumor cells are fermenting so strongly that they're resistant to the very therapies. So if you remove the, th the fermentation, they become extremely vulnerable to oxidative stress. It's our view that we can kill, we think we can kill them just as effectively with hyperbaric oxygen as we can with radiation therapy. Because radiation and hyperbaric will create oxidative stress killing tumor cells, but hyperbaric oxygen will do it without harm to the rest of the body. Mm -hmm. So there are adjunct therapies that are required with metabolic therapies oh, in order to eradicate the cancer. It's called ketogenic metabolic therapy is the term that, that uh, Dr. Winter and uh, others uh, from Germany have, have labeled this strategy, ketogenic metabolic therapy, indicating that the patient is in a state of therapeutic ketosis and at the same time, we're gradually targeting the defective energy metabolism in the tumor cells. So it's, this, it's a global strategy to, it works on the whole body not just the tumor. T the tumors are eliminated gradually because the whole body is going through this dramatic physiological change in response to the, to the changed uh, availability of respiratory and fermentable fuels. And do you have s case stories of patients who've well, gone through this? We're beginning to publish more and more uh, of these kinds of individual case studies. Um, some are successful and some are not successful, just like any, the beginning of any, of any therapy. But what we find is that the most of the people who embark on a metabolic therapy, sometimes it's a hybrid between traditional standards of care together with metabolic therapy. We generally find that their quality of life is better and their overall survival is better. But we have not yet, achieved, we have not yet treated uh, significant numbers of people using metabolic therapy alone. It's a very, very difficult, because we're still at a prototype stage. We're still working out the details. It doesn't make sense to bring in large numbers of people when you have the very individuals needed to, to implement this are untrained and unknowledgeable, and the patients themselves can be uh, mystified or unfamiliar with what the strategy is. So we, we are in developing small numbers of people, individuals, a couple of people here, a couple of people there, working out the details on these individuals and seeing how they're responding and how well they do before we can say we have a, a protocol by which we can treat large numbers of people. We're not there yet because we're still working out the details. The concepts are all there. The, str the, the knowledge base, the logic of why we're doing what we're doing, the science supporting what, we do what we're doing is all there. What we have to do is dosage, timing, and scheduling, and that's where we're working, uh, working on these projects right now. And what is your view on the standard of care? Well, the standard of care has traditionally been um, uh, aggressive surgery, um, followed by chemotherapy or radiation therapy, and now immunotherapy, which may not make, be completely considered part of the standard of care yet, but it's based on the gene theory of cancer. So, um, it, you know, uh, why radiation is designed to just uh, provide a tremendous amount of oxidative stress to DNA replication and then try to stop DNA replication because mutations are driving the, the, the cell cycle, which is an er erroneous. Um, energy is driving. Energy is ultimately driving a cell. Without energy, no cell can survive. So, so we have chemo, very toxic chemicals that we give to people. These chemicals will either bind up the cytoskeleton or also prevent DNA replication. Um, they're designed to stop DNA replication. 
Well, without energy, DNA can't replicate anyway. So, so you can, we, that's what we do. So you have DNA replication, you have toxic chemicals, you have radiation, um, you have surgical mutilation. We try to remove as much of the tissue before we do anything. Um, in some cases that's necessary, in other cases it's unnecessary. We like to shrink tumors down significantly with metabolic therapy and then do surgical resection because now the tumor is shriveled, it's much less angiogenic, it's much less inflamed, and oftentimes you can debulk and remove the entirety without having to destroy large portions of, portions of normal tissue. So, so we, we don't consider, uh, we, we consider surgery as an important component. It just has to be done in the right order rather than the way it's done today. We go in and we just immediately start surgery. A lot of these tumor cells can be led to spread throughout the body, making the situation worse. But if you can bring them all together and shrink them down, surgery can be far, more, far, far more effective. I don't think we should ever poison and irradiate anyone to make them healthy. This is an insane thing based on a failed understanding of what the disease is. Why are we doing this? You want to stop proliferating cells? You pull their energy out. You don't you know, irradiate. Now, not to say that we shouldn't ever irradiate. I mean, it might be necessary in certain circumstances when it's a very difficult, but only after we would do metabolic therapy and we would then bring this, this down to a very, it might, be, it might be okay, but never for brain. I work in brain cancer. Humans with brain tumors should never be irradiated. This is, this is just, it's not, this is, you don't irradiate the human brain. Why should the brain never be irradiated when it Because has it cancer? creates massive, it causes massive inflammation that feeds, it, it frees up massive amounts of glucose and glutamine to the surviving tumor cells. So if you look at the survivability of brain cancer patients, the, the abysmal survival is due in large part to the fact of the treatments that have been given to these people. Radiation, radiation damage is the, is the structure of the neurons, freeing massive amounts of glutamate into the microenvironment, which is then taken up and thrown back at the tumor in the form of glutamine. So this is the, the driver of the, uh, of the disease, and you see why so few people survive. And some people who receive radiation alone, the survival is zero. So this is perfectly predictable based on the changes of the mic microenvironment as the result of the radiation therapy. So my view has been, and I have written, the human brain should rarely, if ever, be irradiated under any conditions. So people can argue with that, but at least for brain cancer, I would say the brain should never be irradiated. And low-grade tumors are made to become high-grade tumors by, by, by these kinds of procedures, called secondary glioblastoma, induced by, by the procedures used to manage the lower-grade tumor. So the whole strategy of what we do uh, using standards of care um, is, is based on a false premise of what the nature of the disease is. And as I said to you before, there are thousands and many thousands of people who have survived standard of care, and they say, well, if it weren't for standard of care, I wouldn't be alive today. You know, but these bodies have paid a tremendous price. And many, many of these poor people have paid a tremendous price. They have um, what we call survivor's Ill ailments, you know, which are, could be neuropsychiatric, hormonal imbalances, digestive imbalances, all these Im physiological imbalances for the fact that you have survived very toxic therapies to treat your disease. If we treat the disease with metabolic therapy, not only do you have not have these conditions, but you emerge from the treatment even healthier than you were when you started. So we feel that we can do this. So why put these poor people through all this torture of toxic uh, approches when you don't need to do that? Starting with metabolic therapy is Starting, the wise choice. Yes. It's, you know, I'm not saying we have it all set yet, but, the, but once, this, is, once this, this becomes established, it's going to make most other therapies obsolete. Most people don't want to be treated with, they fear the treatments as much as they fear the disease. They don't want to be their breasts removed, their colons removed, organs removed, and then being poisoned and irradiated. I mean, this is, this is, this is horrific torture to a lot of people. They suffer immensely from these kinds of therapies, which they feel that, that this is what they have to do to survive. This is wrong. This is based on a false understanding of what the disease is. If you know it's a metabolic disease, you don't have to be doing all this stuff. Why people walk around with a bald head? And I always say, if you see a person with a bald head, that person was treated by someone who is fundamentally lacks knowledge on the biology of the disease. People shouldn't have to lose their hair when they're being treated for cancer. Well, because they're given toxic poisons that stop all proliferation. You want to stop the proliferation of the tumor cell, not your hair growth. So, um, but this is, the, this is the way it is today. And, and unfortunately, many people have to suffer and die as the result of these treatments. 
I'm sure you have a lot of people who reach out to you who are recently diagnosed or who have a loved one diagnosed with cancer. What is your advice to them? Well, I always put, I'm not a physician, so I try to give them and get them in contact with people that understand what we're talking about. People, physicians, oncologists who have knowledge who can help them use metabolic therapy, whether, whether in combination with standard of, thera standard of care or whether it's metabolic therapy by itself. It depends on the availability of these people. Unfortunately, there's so few uh, oncologists that are trained to even understand. They, they can understand, they've never had the, they've never been told about this. You know, this is the problem. So many of these poor patients, they hear our stuff, they look at our stuff, I want to do metabolic therapy. Well, I can't treat them. I know the concepts. I know the science. I, I know the outcomes. I know what can be done, but I personally cannot treat anyone. So they have to go to be seen by a professional in the field, and that professional should guide them through. And that's where we have this incredible lack. Uh, it's it's a, an absence of trained professionals that can implement metabolic therapy. You've been writing and speaking about this for quite some time. Why is it that we still have a lack of professionals who understand this? Well, I think you just have to look at the curriculum at the medical schools. I mean, if we're training people to treat cancer, we're not training them to understand cancer as a metabolic disease. When you go through the medical training program, the first thing you get is cancer is a genetic disease. Well, therefore, that justifies why we must continue to use the procedures that we're using. So you're not getting information to say cancer is, is a, a metabolic disease and not a genetic, it comes back to the origin of the disease. If the dogmatic view, which is an irrefutable truth, substantiated in all the med major medical schools and in textbooks and in the National Cancer Institute that it's a genetic disease, then irradiating po people, poisoning people, and doing this kind of thing to stop proliferation of cells that are genetically programmed to be out of control, you get the situation you have. You don't have this new uh, advance in understanding of the disease, which is going to have to come because the current standards are failing. As I said, we have 1,600 people a day in this country dying. It gets worse every year. It's getting worse all over the world. So people will wake up at some point and say, what we've been doing for as many years as we've been doing, this isn't working for the majority of people. And even the survivors who may, who may survive have put their bodies at significant risk for other ailments that will reduce their quality of life and their overall survival on the planet. Is there an element of psychological inertia that's preventing the adoption of these ideas? Well, I think some of it has to do well, I, I think physicians, most physicians mean well. They're very interested in the well-being of their patients. I think they would, they would like to know how to do this and implement this. On the other hand, you have an institution that has, a, has generated revenue, significant revenues, applying toxic chemicals and radiation to patients. So are we going to, how are we going to bring metabolic therapy in not to disrupt revenue generation for the hospitals and the physicians? So that has to be worked out by, by someone else. I, I can't do that. I don't know the mechanisms of doing that. I know the mechanisms of how the disease happens and how to prevent the disease, but in the uh, actual switch over to an alternative approach without causing a massive disruption in revenue generation, um, we, have to, we have to work on that. Is it fair to say that you believe that there are a lot of perverse incentives maintaining the current standard of care and preventing the metabolic therapy? from I don't from know being if they're perverse. I, I just think they, 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 they have been so, so accustomed to thinking that this is the way it's done, that anything that comes along that's different is, is viewed as skeptical. Um, and I think that's just the natural way of things. I think whenever you have a major paradigm shift, you're always going to have a massive amount of resistance at first. The issue here, of course, is that we have all of these poor people dying and suffering every day. I mean, this is, this is a, a problem. And, and the issue is, do we want to maintain death and suffering? So we have to wait for people who, who, who need to be retrained in this, in, this whole, in this whole field. Because I believe that we can save so many more lives and reduce the suffering if we, if we adapt to metabolic therapy. Is it going to be easy? It's just dosage, timing, and scheduling. Many of these physicians are already trained to do a lot of this. They just are not ap applying it in light of what we know the nature of the diseases. And I think once we, we know that, 
Uh, we've, we've given an outline. We, we've pr provided a framework for doing this in the press pulse therapy. Any physician can look at that and say, oh, I can do that. I can do this. This is not too, too difficult. Oh, we can do these kinds of measurements. So it's not like something that they can't do. It's just that they have not done it before. There was no imp impulse imp uh, uh, imp um, uh, strategy to do this for them now that we have. There, there's no incentive for them, other than the fact that they would like to keep their cancer patients healthy while being treated, which I think is a powerful incentive. And I also think the pa cancer patients themselves are interested in living, and they're not interested in being irradiated and poisoned and all this. They want to have their disease managed. But you have compliance issues. The, the metabolic therapy is not without some difficulty in compliance, but so is standard of care. A lot of people don't want to maintain compliance with toxic chemicals and immunotherapies. It's too, too stressful for them. So compliance is an issue with all kinds of approaches, including metabolic therapy. So you have to have knowledgeable people, patients, families, and physicians all must be knowledgeable uh, 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 about what's involved in this. I think once this comes and becomes more, more uh, recognized, I think the compliance issue will gradually become um, managed better. They say an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of the cure. If you have yes. recommendations for cancer prevention, what would they be? Well, I mean, as I said, you, the risk of cancer is very low if you keep your mitochondria healthy. So keeping your mitochondria healthy is the best way to prevent cancer. The problem, as I mentioned before, doing this in our modern society is oftentimes very, very difficult. I mean, water-only therapeutic, fa therapeutic fasting, which people will say, well, you got to be nuts to do that. Um, trying to keep your uh, systemic inflammation down, lowering blood sugar, sugar and elevating ketones, a pristine fuel for mi maintaining mitochondria health. Um, there's a lot of things that we can do. The problem is they're not, they're not easy to do. Um, most people enjoy, you know, high carbohydrate foods. Uh, most people enjoy um, the kinds of lifestyles that put us at risk for systemic inflammation and cancer. So you have to, but I, but I still think, I still think there comes a time, and this is why I always felt religion can be very important because I said almost every religion has some sort of a, a fasting period. So people could easily dovetail a cancer prevention in with the religious fasting period get two birds with one stone, right? Prevent your cancer, but at the same time become more spiritual. And uh, now, of course, that's a, a little bit of a stretch, but you asked me the question, and I said, what is the best way to do this? But I, but I think a lot of religions today have become less ri uh, r rigorous in maintaining these old ways. You know, so you have to go back and say, okay, can you fast for 30 days, water only? I mean, this was the ultimate like, goal. And most religions today have watered down many of these old ways to make it a little bit, again, a little bit less problematic. Otherwise, they're going to lose their followers if everybody, you can't join my religion unless you water only fast for 30 days. Well, how many people are going to sign up for that, right? <laughs> Perhaps so, the future is going to There's going to be a few. Like there's the always a few. Yeah. But you, you want to get the, the bigger flock. So you have, to, you have to work these things in. But I, but I think you asked me how to, pre how to prevent cancer. And I, I think the be best way is protect mitochondria, and there are many ways to do that. Um, uh, and people, and that's why the food industry is interested, but I, I can't validate anything that the food industry is doing. Uh, if you can get into therapeutic ketosis, I think that's a, a step in the right direction. At least you have a biomarker to know that. Um, there are some new apps on he Heads Up Health apps, the various kinds of apps that will record everything you do, how many steps you take, what you eat, your hours of sleep, your therapeutic ketosis. I mean, people love to, some people love to do all this stuff. Th this would then reduce risk for cancer. So there's a lot of things you can do, but some of them are not easy. Thank you so much for joining us. It's a yeah, pleasure. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for joining us today. We hope you join us next time as we examine and elucidate the frontiers of science and technology with the thinkers creating our tomorrow. Until next time, farewell.